And I'm going to level with you right from the start here. The RTX 1490 has ruined us. It was too good and for a $1600 card, too cheap. So if you were hoping to see Nvidia's RTX 5090 delivering the same sort of generational frame rate increase that we saw going from the RTX 3090 to the RTX 4090, then we probably need to have a little chat. That's, uh, yeah, that's not happening this time. Nvidia wasn't messing around when it claimed a 30% 4K gaming performance bump from my own testing this past week. That's pretty much what I'm seeing too. Now, that's not bad, but when the top chips of the Ampere generation offered a 50% performance boost, and then Ada delivered a ridiculous 80% increase in 4K gaming rendering power, well, that 30% figure is starting to look a touch miserly. But the RTX 5090 is a new kind of ultra-enthusiast graphics card. One that's been built both for an era of silicon austerity and AI dominance, and one that's begging us to be a little bit more realistic about our expectations. Luckily, the RTX Blackwell generation also comes with a magic trick, one that manufactures unfeasibly high, smooth frame rates out of thin air, and also comes with the promise of more in the future of this new era of neural rendering. The RTX Blackwell elevator pitch is that Moore's law is dead. We can no longer either get a doubling of transistors every couple of years, or alternatively, the cost of those transistors halving. At least, that's not what we're seeing with the $400 price bump of the RTX 5090 over the 4090. And if we can't realistically or economically continue to make ever more massive GPUs every other year to sate our demands for more graphics processing power, what do you do? According to Nvidia, you make AI do the rendering grunt work for you. Yes, AI. It's always AI. DLSS was the first instance of neural rendering back when it was required to make ray tracing more palatable with the RTX 20 series Turing cards. It's now been updated in this generation to incorporate the same sort of AI model that's powering modern large language models, the Transformer. Frame generation is another piece of the neural rendering puzzle, and that again has been evolving with the RTX Blackwell cards. It's now capable of delivering up to three extra AI generated frames in between the two actually rendered ones. When you piece these two things together, we're now at a point where 15 out of 16 pixels in some games are being generated by AI rather than what Nvidia is now calling, somewhat disdainfully, brute force rendering. Yeah, you know, rendering like an ape smashing two rocks together. But there is some extra hardware in this GPU making all of that AI stuff work, and it's not all about AI models and tensor cores. Nvidia has jammed an enhanced module into the uh, RTX 5090's display engine, which means the CPU no longer has to get involved with frame pacing. This flip metering tech ensures all those extra frames get delivered to the screen in a smooth way, and not in a lumpy way, as Nvidia's Brian Catanzaro described it to us at CES. There's also a new AI model in there, making it 40% quicker in terms of frame generation and 30% lighter on VRAM, though this AI model removes the need for another lump of hardware, the optical flow accelerator is no longer needed. Which incidentally could be good news for the RTX 30 series gamers, because the weaker optical flow silicon in the Ampere GPUs was one of the main reasons given for frame generation not being enabled on those older cards. Nvidia now says it would take more optimization and testing to get it working on 30 series cards, but notably it's no longer talking about a hardware lock. Those are the features of the new RTX Blackwell GPUs that we can enjoy right now, with pretty much every DLSS and frame gen supporting game able to be upgraded, either natively by the devs, as Nvidia has made sure to keep compatibility with old DLSS versions, or via the Nvidia app with its new funky DLSS override feature. Basically, if a game doesn't have multi-frame gen or the new DLSS transformer model in there natively, you can simply inject it via the new app. And no, you don't even have to sign in. But there is some element of future gazing to this new architecture too, which promises to make the RTX 50 series even better over time. The biggest change to the actual GPU itself is the ability for the shader cores to now have direct access to the tensor cores. Those are the smart silicon lumps that do all the AI matrix processing for GeForce cards. But previously, they had to be programmed via CUDA, and now any programmable shader in the GPU can hit them with workloads. Features such as neural texture compression, which can lighten the load on your VRAM by up to seven times, neural radiance cache to improve lighting, and RTX skin and RTX neural faces, which overlay AI-generated visuals over simple models for more lifelike effects, they're all promising technologies which could push computer graphics on hugely over the next few years. Equally, mega geometry could be massive for anybody wanting to go big with Unreal Engine 5 and Nanite, this allows them to dramatically increase the amount of geometry in a scene. It really has to be seen to be believed. Just check out the Zora demo. It's potentially stunning what it could do in future games. And having experienced this demo running in real time in the RTX 5090, I was blown away. You'll have probably realized by now that I've not said word one about the actual GPU inside this graphics card. That's because fundamentally, 
not a huge amount has actually changed from the Silicon of the Ada cards last generation. There are still 128 CUDA cores per streaming multiprocessor, though now all of those cores can be used to do either integer or floating point calculations, with no purely dedicated FP32 cores anymore. And it essentially looks the same when you take in the block diagrams too. The GB202 GPU at the heart of this RTX 5090 has 21% more transistors than the AD102 and a commensurate 21% increase in die size because it's all on the same custom TSMC 4N production process. There are 21,760 CUDA cores available in the chip, which is a third more than the RTX 4090. Though, interestingly, this isn't the full top-tier Blackwell GPU. The RTX 5090 has locked off one full graphics processing cluster, leaving around 2800 CUDA cores on the cutting room floor. I guess that leaves room for a 5090 Ti or a Titan down the line if Nvidia deems it necessary. You are getting the full complement of L2 cache, however, with near 100 MB available to the GPU. But then you're also seeing 32GB of fast GDDR7 memory too, on a proper 512-bit memory bus. That means you're getting a ton more memory bandwidth, 78% more than the 4090 could offer. It is, though, a much more power-hungry beast, with a total graphics power of 575 watts. And I've seen this card pulling down more than 600 watts at times. But this Founders Edition is pretty. Half the width of the previous RTX 90 class cards, it feels like it's sort of the same weight. Despite that, it still stays relatively cool and pleasingly quiet, peaking at just over 77 degrees centigrade in my open test rig. Though this dual blow-through design is going to mean you have to think about where you position your card in your PC. In my PC's vertical GPU mount, that would end up blowing a ton of hot air back over the processor and my motherboard. So now we come to gaming performance. This is the key, right? How does it actually perform in the real world? Well, in a word, brilliantly. I am only seeing the same sort of 30% frame rate increase that Nvidia itself was touting in terms of the straight 4K gen on gen rendering performance. Occasionally it's higher, occasionally a bit lower. Um, I'm seeing around sort of like 25 to 40% in real terms. Below that 4K um, resolution, however, the hike is definitely lower. I'm seeing sort of like 12% and 20% respectively for 1080p and 1440p. But that's mostly because even though I've got the fastest gaming CPU in the world in my test rig, the AMD Ryzen 7 9800X 3D, it becomes the bottleneck at 1080p and 1440p. Still, <laughs> who's buying a two grand graphics card to play at 1080p anyway? I mean, with DLS, you kind of are paying two grand to play at lower resolutions, but whatever. Multi-frame generation feels almost indistinguishable from Magic. The new RTX 50 series only feature, for now, is working to stunning effect in the games I've been able to test it out in. Alan Wake 2 here goes from scraping 30 FPS at peak native 4K settings up to 180 FPS on average with DLSS quality and 4K MFG. Now, latency is key, right? That's the biggie with frame gen. You're rendering two frames and then backfilling the space with now up to three extra AI generated frames. So surely you'll get a ton more input lag. In my head, it seemed to make sense that the more frames that the GPU generates, the more lag that you'd get. Uh, no, not a job. You get practically the same latency for two times frame gen as with three and four times. And considering that I was getting 93 milliseconds of PC latency at 4K native in Alan Wake 2, the fact that that drops down to 66 milliseconds with DLSS and four times multi-frame gen, well, it's frankly, psh. That's also as bad as it got in my testing when it comes to frame gen latency. In Cyberpunk, I went from 34 FPS and 54 milliseconds of latency up to 215 FPS and down to 43 milliseconds of PC latency. Then in Dragon Age Veilguard, where MFG was enabled via the DLSS override feature, my frame rate went from 81 FPS and 28 milliseconds at native to 315 FPS and 32 milliseconds with DLSS quality and four times frame gen. Okay, that is just a handful of games, and if those were the only ones available at launch, MFG would not be the able panacea to the 5090's somewhat limited rendering performance bump that it is. But with fully 75 games and apps ready to roll when your RTX 5090 arrives at your door, most of the best games, and certainly the most demanding ones, will be rocking MFG natively or through the NVIDIA app on day one. Now it's important to say straight off the bat though that frame generation is not perfect. As good as it is, there are still some instances where it doesn't quite look as good as native rendering. I mean, that's inevitable. And I found times in Alan Wake 2 especially where flashing the torch around where it starts to break down. But it was never in any game or immersion breaking kind of way, and certainly not in a way that would have me saying, you know what, I'm gonna go back to gaming at 30 FPS. I mean, hey, I'd love to be batting around 200 FPS just using pure rendering, but looking at where we are right now, it's going to take a long time, a lot of process node shrinks, and a ton more transistors than there are stars in the sky to get there. 
until then, I'll take a little AI assistance. What's more disappointing, however, is the new DLSS transformer model. We were promised that it was going to deliver a more consistent, stable level of image quality, both for ray reconstruction and for upscaling. And it does, for the most part. There is still some ghosting visible with ray reconstruction, even with the transformer model enabled, but it also introduces some other weird artifacts. Text, as anyone familiar with AI image generation will know, is kind of tricksome for a transformer. And so it is with Alan Wake 2 at the computer. It just looks damn weird. There are other instances though where it looks great. Indeed, in Dragon Age Veilguard, I'd say that the DLSS quality version looks a lot better than the natively rendered image. But it's not the same game-changing version of DLSS I was expecting, having looked at some of the demos we were presented with at CES. So how do we feel about the RTX 5090 Founders Edition? Well, one thing to say straight away is that this is the version of the RTX 5090 that you will want to buy. It's the MSRP version, so it's likely to be as cheap as it's going to get for the entirety of this year. But it's also the version of the 5090 you're going to be disappointed you didn't get, because stock of this card is surely going to vanish in a hot minute. I've always found the big old RTX 4090 and 3090s just ludicrously sized. And the same for the AIB versions, so I'm all about going back to the old school dual slot size. Yes, it's a little bit hotter and my original unit had some vicious coil wine, but the design hits all those stealth build notes for me. It's nice and curvy and subtle and black. But as for the RTX 1590 as a whole, well I'm cautiously positive. It's easy to feel pretty down on the card given that the 30% gen on gen 4k rendering performance increase looks kind of disappointing. We've been treated to a 50% bump from Turing to Ampere, and then a frankly ludicrous 80% hike from Ampere to Ada. And if Nvidia had been purely relying on its DLSS upscaling to gild its gaming numbers, then I'd have been looking at this Vanguard of the RTX 50 series with a wrinkled nose and a raised eyebrow at its 2K sticker price. But multi-frame generation is giving me a level of ludicrous smooth gaming performance that has me feeling like a bit of a convert to this whole brave new world of neural rendering. Yeah. I'm an AI convert. Weird. As much as there are the occasional, surprisingly so, artifacts associated with frame gen, the latency, even at 4x, isn't an issue in any of the games I've tested and never made me want to turn it off. It's this gaming experience that will have you full hook, line and sinker for the RTX 5090. The issue, I guess, is that as much as it is in a wide range of games at day one, it's not available in every game. Your GPU straight rendering performance, however, is available to every game you throw at your new card from a two-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old PC game to a modern day one. So yeah, I'd love to have this sort of frame rate rendered natively, and it would absolutely look better on screen. But that's not going to happen, at least not in this generation, and not without a big bump in price either. I mean, we do still have a $400 price hike over the RTX 4090's MSRP, but if we're being reasonable, the RTX 4090 has been sitting around the $2,000 level for most of its lifetime, though it does still leave a huge gap between this and the half GPU that is the RTX 5080 to come at 999. The counter to all the noise about the death of Moore's Law that surrounds Nvidia's push for this new era of neural rendering is again the RTX 4090 spoiled us with massive improvements in recent memory. With its node shrink from Samsung's 8 nanometer to the TSMC 4N node, Nvidia gave us 170% more transistors with a 3% die shrink. That card also delivered us 80% more 4K rendering performance. So it's hard not to think that when Nvidia switches to a nominal 2 nanometer production node eventually, it could still produce that sort of rendering performance bump, whether Gordon Moore's casual rules of economics are toast or not. So. Maybe when the RTX 60 series drops, eh? But for this generation, Nvidia has produced a card necessarily leaning on AI to bring us a huge leap in gaming performance. For the most part, it's worked. Though I will say the RTX 5090 is going to be the card that mostly benefits from multi-frame generation. I can't help but think that that benefit is going to shrink as we get further down the 50 series stack. I've been Dave. Looks like the AI overlords have won. So thanks for watching. Let us know what you think of the new card in the comments and whether you're going to be in line for it or not. Catch you later.